welcome. This is the first Critical Thinkers series in religion law and social theory for the year, and we're so pleased that you have all come. I am Heather Shipley. I'm the project manager for the Religion and Diversity Project. The logo is there. And the other, the co-organizers for the series are Lori Beeman, Pascal Fournier, Andre La Liberté, Elka Winter, and Sonia Sika. Um, and we have funding from the Faculty of Law. Professor Berliner Blau has been doing a whirlwind tour of Montreal and Ottawa this week, and this is his final lecture in his whirlwind tour. The next talk in the series, just to let you know, and all this information is on our website, will be Mary Jo Knights from the University of Missouri, and that will be in January 2016. And she will be talking on religion and emotion. So we do have an events listserv, and Tess Compo is in charge of that. So if you would like to be on that, you can always give her your email address, and she'll keep you informed about our upcoming events. So today's talk is Jacques Berliner Blau from Georgetown University, and as I say, he's been doing kind of a whirlwind. He was first at the University of Montreal, and he spoke in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa yesterday, and is now here, and his topic, as you know, is secularism, the misunderstood and essential ism. <coughs> professor Berliner Blau is professor and director of Jewish civilization at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. He holds separate doctorates in Biblical Hebrew and theoretical sociology, and combines his training to produce various interdisciplinary books and articles. He has also written extensively about Jewish American literature, and ser serves as a book review editor at the journal Philip Roth Studies. And this is a subject of his talks earlier this week at UDM and here at the Faculty of Law. Some of his many publications include The Secular Bible, Why Non-Believers Must Take Religion Seriously, Thumping It, The Use and Abuse of the Bible in Today's Presidential Politics, and How to Be Secular, A Call to Arms for Religious Freedom. And most recently, he has published Secularism on the Edge, and Professed and Confessed, Notes from the Academy as Scholars Publish, Perish, and Ignore Their Students. And so as there are many students in here, you might have some questions about that in the Q&A session. But without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Berlin and Rob. Thanks very much. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the University of Ottawa and the Project on Religion and Diversity for inviting me. I want to extend my gratitude to my colleague, Professor Heather Shipley, and Professor Lori Beeman, who could not be here today, unfortunately. Also, Tess Campo, thank you so much. And Pascal Fournier, who is kind of a larger-than-life uh, intellectual presence in two, three, maybe four cities, uh, who invited me to uh, Montreal. I also want to say that uh, I'm from New York City, and I'm probably the only person from New York City that thinks Canada's really cool, right? Um, <laughs> so, as I was saying yesterday over the summer when I was watching the Women's World Cup in Washington, D.C., where I now live, I was surreptitiously rooting for you guys. Um, I don't think it worked. But I was trying, anyhow, I was doing my best. Um, so I'm a very, very big fan of Canada. I think the city here is very beautiful, and it reminds me of Geneva and Zurich at the same time. I don't quite know why, but I'll figure it out. I swear I will figure it out. The name of my talk tonight is Secularism, the Misunderstood and Essential Ism. Uh, the book that I'm currently writing called Professed and Confessed is about the importance of teaching and the importance of professors, that is scholars, who devote themselves to their students. So I am unashamed of saying I spend my day with 18 to 22 year olds, right? and that is what um, Max Weber referred to as my vocation, my calling. So you're going to see me today really break this down uh, to use an American expression. And we're going to take a very deep dive to use an American expression. I have a secret theory that when people come to these lectures, they understand like 6%, 8% of what the lecturer is saying, though they do get awful lot of tweets and emails to friends, and they check agendas and calendars. So I'm going to really try and explain this to you. I, if it's just too simple, I, I just don't think it's too simple because I'm one of the few people that knows it, right? So I don't understand how it could be too simple since the subject matter is generally not known. All right, so here we go. We're going to start. Um, put on your thinking caps, as we used to say, because it's not going to be easy. 
Uh, the most important part of a presentation is the question and answer period at the end. So I hope that's really robust. I hope you come at me from a thousand different directions, and I might come at you uh, as well. So here we go. I want to start with this visual right here. Oh, I love prezies. Okay. Uh, the way I would do this with students is I'd say, show of hands, can somebody please tell me what secularism means, right? So just to save a little time, here are some of the possibilities that people uh, bear in mind when they hear the term secularism. I understand there's this nuance in Quebec of laïcité. I've written a little bit about it here, and I'm sure that will come up in our question and answers. Um, State-sponsored atheism, disestablishmentarianism, I'll explain to you where that comes from, accommodationism, which probably few of you are actually familiar with, but you actually know it without knowing the term, separation of church and state, that old standby, it's a classic, right? Non-cognizance, we'll do some American history and we'll get that, state control of religion, uh, laïcité. All right, so that's up, we're gonna get back to this graphic in about half an hour uh, as we try to unpuzzle this. Okay, everyone. Secularism is one of the most confused and mangled isms. Oh, we're in Canada. Seven, secularity, Charles Taylor's thing, right? One can't lecture here unless, unless one mentions Charles Taylor. I'll be happy again to deal with his concept of secularity uh, in the Q&A. Secularism is one of the most confused and mangled isms in the American and Canadian political lexicon. It is used in countless different ways by journalists, politicians, policy analysts, and yes, even scholars. The resulting cacophony has almost vitiated the concept's usefulness. I say almost because I'm going to try to identify some really useful parameters for thinking about an idea which is much maligned, but which I feel has great value for those of us in the advanced liberal democracies. We can say that about ourselves in the United States and Canada. We are like the 400 level democracies and the 500 level, as we say in the United States, we're upper course liberal democracies. All right, here we go. Boom. All right, so let's talk about some fumbles. Uh, it's a football metaphor, sorry. Largely secular is not the descriptor. Largely secular is not the descriptor that leaps to mind when thinking about Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. But that's what James Clapper, US Director of National Intelligence, called the group while testifying to Congress in 2011. Outrage ensued, and within hours, his office, to use the Washington adage, walked it back. The news release read as follows. To clarify Director Clapper's point, in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood makes efforts to work through a political system that has been under Mubarak's rule one that is largely secular in its orientation. He is well aware that the Muslim Brotherhood is not a secular organization. Now it was, why not? The Mubarak regime's turn to be acclaimed as largely secular. If by secularism we mean not protecting religious minorities and not respecting freedom of speech, well, then I guess the director of national intelligence was onto something. Though perhaps we should cut Clapper some slack he wouldn't be the first or last public figure in the United States to utter completely preposterous and contradictory things about secularism. So that's James Clapper over there. I found out in the worst possible way that he's my colleague at Georgetown University. So that was unpleasant. <laughs> we both found out. To his right, it's a very American sort of politician, the former Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum, who is currently running for president, he's polling about 0.5%. Right, during a 2012 Republican presidential debate, he criticized President Obama's secular ideology as being, quote, against the traditions of our country. Strangely enough, this came a few minutes after he spoke of the necessity of a secular Pakistan. Secularism, Santorum implied, was bad for us but good for them. Speaking of which, here's our president. President Obama employs his own double standard when using the S word. He scoffed at the knee-jerk, amoral secularism of his own party in the audacity of hope. Yet when he rolled out his Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships in 2009, he emphasized its inclusion of secular citizens and organizations. It took people in the United States years to understand that Barack Obama, part of his strategy for getting a Democrat back into the White House, 
was to completely sever the link between the Democratic Party and secularism. And he did a very, very good job of demagoguing that into oblivion, but it really wasn't a salutary development for those of us that think secularism is a good idea. So um, this is what we call nonpartisanship uh, in the United States. Uh, we have scored a neutral public official, James Clapper, uh, an extreme conservative in the figure of Rick Santorum, and a centrist Democrat, uh, as is our president, Barack Obama. As you can tell, we have something like a crisis of nomenclature. For some, secularism is deeply un-American, but good for Pakistan. For others, secularism is akin to atheism, which means that it must be hostile to religion, and thus bad for America. For still others, secularism is about separation of church and state, that's good or bad, depending on your point of view. And for those who think that it's bad, the assumption is that it must be bad for something called religious freedom. At the end of this lecture, I'm going to introduce another term, accommodationism, and I'm going to make the point that most of our discourse on secularism in Canada and in the United States is based on completely fallacious assumptions. Now, I did spend a little time, and I really enjoyed that time, back here in 2013, I was at McGill right when the Charte de Valeur Québécoise was raging of the PQ. That was fun, all right? That was kind of a test case uh, for studies of secularism. I'm sure that will come up in the Q&A uh, as it did uh, back then. What I'm gonna do now is a little bit weird. I'm gonna walk you through the heretofore uninvestigated genealogy of secularism. I wanna make a point that will probably surprise and perplex many of you, a point that I hope will be well worth the price of admission tonight. Secularism is, I claim, along with a few other scholars, is really an idea that emerges from Christian political philosophy. All right? So this usually kind of elicits a double take from an audience. All right? It comes right out of the core of Christian thought. All right? Most people are like, no, it's atheism. How about a couple? By the way, atheism comes out of the core of Christian thought. But that's another lecture for another time. I do mean that, by the way. There's some very fine books that make that point. Without the existence of certain developments within Christian theological speculation, we would never have arrived at secularism today. In all my years researching and teaching this subject, that's 15 in all, I'd say this is the concept that most beguiles my audiences. All right, you're probably scratching your head as we speak. Christian fundamentalists simply refuse to accept this because they think secularism is atheism and the Antichrist. Atheist fundamentalists, which exist, refuse to accept it because they think secularism is atheism and that secularism is the opposite of anything Christian. They're both really, really, really wrong. All right? And unfortunately, the public discourse, at least in my country and perhaps in yours, it, no, not in yours, by the way, is pitched right, between the Christian right over here and the stride of new atheists over there. And there's this huge middle sector of the population which has been rendered virtually mute in public conversations. So let's get to the fascinating interplay between Christianity and secularism, and this is going to be a slog, all right? I'm going to do everything within my power to liven this up, uh, but it's complicated stuff. So here we go, everyone. Uh, this, by the way, is called the Prezi. I don't know if you guys have this in Canada these days, but it's awesome, right? It's so much better than the PowerPoint. PowerPoint is nothing compared to this. Okay, <laughs> secularism's DNA is inextricably bound up with Christianity. What I've tried to do in my research is reconstruct the genealogy of the secular idea. If you will, I have sequenced the genome of secularism. Or I'm trying to figure out where it comes from. And I'm sort of stunned that so few professors shared my curiosity about it. There are